Thank you, worship team. Thank you, worship dancers. Thank you, worshipers. Yeah, it's a participation sport. No out of courtyard here. Yep. But don't let your worship stop here. It's just a, a place to get tanked up. Like you used to always go to the Mount of Olives to get tanked up. Just get tanked up and then pour it out. And then tomorrow you got to get tanked up again, right? Tomorrow morning, you got to get tanked up, pour it out. Then Monday, you know what it has to be? Got to get tanked up. Because it's, it's like the manna, it doesn't, it doesn't stay over. You try to keep it, it rots. So, um, I, I want to show you some pictures, not today, maybe next week, of Herzog Hospital and Nevin Michael and some of the other things that we do over there that are different than the, you know, the traditional tour. But, you know, with that being said, I just, I just want you to know we, we did take a boat ride uh, with the Lord on the Galilee, and uh, we saw him multiply uh, at Topka, and we heard him preach at the synagogue in Capernaum. You remember that, Sweet Pea? And we saw him transfigure at Mount Tabor, and we went to the Bethesda pool where the cripple was healed, and we went to the pool of Siloam where the blind man saw. We went to the Garden of Gethsemane in order to fellowship in his sufferings, and Antonio's fortress to experience his mock trial, if you will, conviction and crucifixion. And then lastly, we went to the Garden Tomb only to find that there was nothing to see. And then, of course, we went to the Mount of Olives so that we can uh, see the area where he'll return. And, you know, I shared with people that it's so funny when the book of Zechariah in the Old Testament speaks about that the mountains, you know, there will be a rift and it will move to the north and the south. And you look at the Eastern Gate. It's, it's called the Eastern Gate. I know some people call it the Royal Gate, but it's really called the Eastern Gate. But, but the Jewish people, my people call it Sha'ah HaRachamim, the Gates of Mercy. And that's the gate that they're waiting for the Messiah to walk through, of course. And um, the, the Ottoman Turks were kind enough to seal it up, thank God, so that there won't be any fake messiahs trying to get through it. But, you know, people don't take the Bible literally sometimes, but actually, they, you know, seismologists found the fault line exactly from the Mount of Olives right to the East Gate. And I remember some guy once said that to me, Rabbi, who put that there? I'm like, duh, Genesis, <laughs> Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the... Anyway, Zachariah didn't think that up. People say, is it just going to happen, miraculous? There's a fault line. Fault line. So um, anyway, I always like to go to, you know, the, the gates of mercy because it's, it's something. It's just unbelievable. You know, that's also the gate that Yeshua came in on, on Pesach. But uh, he, won't, he won't come back as a suffering servant. He'll come back as the conquering king. You know, I sit, I sit, with, I sit with some of my really religious Orthodox friends there and I go, look, this is the difference, dude. I said, did you circumcise your boys on, on the eighth day? I circumcised my boys on the eighth day. I said, I don't know what you're doing on Friday night, but I'm home every Friday night celebrating Shabbat with my family. And were well, your son's bar mitzvah in the 13th year, so are mine. Do you celebrate the feast and fast on Yom Kippur, so do I. I said, so you know what the difference is? When Messiah comes through that gate, you're going to go, oh, look, the first coming, I'm going to go, look, no, he's back. <laughs> he's back. That's the difference. And my people can't, can't, wrap their minds around it because they won't sit to even discuss it. But it's changing. It's changing in Israel because they see, they're seeing that the Messianic community are the, some of the most benevolent there is. And you know, the bottom line is when you're helping people in need and you're doing it out of love. You know, Haver always says to me, she, she's my best friend. She calls me her best friend. She says in front of everybody, I said, hey, but you don't have to build me up. You could spit on me and I'm still going to help the children. You follow? But it's a, we have a relationship now that's second to none, and even with her husband, David, and some of her peeps, it's just it's crazy. But it takes time. Yes. You know, most people are just afraid. They're just afraid. But it takes time. And now they realize, I'm not, I'm not trying to headlock Jewish people and turn them into Christians. I'm trying to turn them into Jews. Yes. Most of my people are secular. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, it's, it's really interesting. Sometimes you feel like you're in the middle. You know, you've got the Jewish community hocking you and saying, why don't you just give up this Yeshua? You, you love being a Jew, right? And then you got the Christian community who's like, obviously you love Yeshua. Why don't you give up this Jewish stuff? And then you got sometimes your own people saying, we need to do this, we need to do that. So it's from out, it's from within. But you know what? 
I'm going to hang with God and see what he wants, and I'm going to pay attention to that, and I'm going to keep focused on that, and that's, that's, that's the direction. That's the direction I'm going in. You know, I'm no performer, but if I was, I'd play to an audience of one. So hopefully he'll be happy, and if you're not, take it up with him. Let's move on, okay? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about something uh, today that uh, is near and dear to my heart. Um, many cultures, many cultures all around the world, if you study world history, prior to the incarnation of Yeshua, meaning prior to his appearance, had rituals involving a scapegoat. Some even, some if you look into some of these cultures, some even would put a purple robe on the goat, some would put a crown of gold on the goat, but it's, it's and, and even in Judaism, right, there were two goats on Yom Kippur, Chetat, which represented the goat for sin, and they would, you know, slay that goat sacrifice, and then Hazazel, right, the scapegoat, it means scapegoat in, in English from the Hebrew, they would send it out to the wilderness to take the sins away from the camp, right? So this is not unfamiliar even to us biblically. Many, many societies, like I said, in regular intervals, a community, this is why they did it, they would try to purge themselves of evils that were besetting it. Evils like divisions. Divisions have always been around. They always will be around. You know, I know people think, well, well in, in India, right, Rabbi, or Africa, there's no divisions. There would be no divisions in India and Africa if there was no people. There's no such thing as an African human nature or a Czechoslovakian human nature. Is Helene Schlosser here today? <laughs> the first day Helene Schlosser came here, I didn't know she was here, but I was just kidding around. So I said, because you guys still don't know when I'm joking, right? <laughs> it's like I have to tell them. I'm ready to tell a joke now. But I said, there's two things I really can't stand. One is ethnic prejudice, and the other is the Dutch. And it was Helene Schloss's first visit, and she comes up to me, and she goes, Rabbi, I am from Holland. I was like, oh, yeah, do you live in a windmill? Where's your clogs? And then we became friends ever since. But divisions, divisions, because human nature divides. God's nature unites. It was rivalries. People are always, con jealousies. You know, jealousy is the father of all sin. I don't understand you guys. Somebody gets a new car, what are you so upset about? Are they asking you to make the payment? And why aren't you happy for them? What's wrong with you? I don't understand. Especially my, you know, my couple of pastor friends, I always tell them, they're two guys. Dean Hahn, by the way, was in Israel. He was the Bible instructor for 200 people, four buses for the Family Research Council. I'm not familiar with them, but maybe you are. Anyway, so I ran into him at a site. And he goes, can I talk to your people? I was like, yeah, man, get on the bus. You right? Was he there? How many were you there? He was there, right? Got on the bus, that was crazy. But anyway, jealousy. Yeah, I don't understand. Somebody in the, con and this is, this is, this is always, this is a, not Jewish congregational life. Jewish congregational life, the rabbis are important. They're not getting as important as they used to be. But in Jew Jewish circles, it's rabbi, it's doctor, it's lawyer, it's business person. That's how the list goes in Jewish world, okay? If the rabbi's driving a jalopy, it's a, bit, it's a reflection on them. Something's radically wrong. In Christianity, it's like doctor, lawyer, businessman, teacher, architect, uh, guy that picks up the, the dung at the, uh, at the circus, pastor. It's changing, but is it true, Rose? You've been involved all your life. Your brothers are pastors. It's crazy. In other words, if you get a call, hallelujah, if I get a call, well, what, what's going on? Sick. It's, it's, don't you think about it? Don't you think about how you think? Do you ever think about how you think? <laughs> so they had jealousies, rivalries, divisions, violence, violence. I mean, Cain killed his brother. That was a long time ago. Out of what? Golly jeepers, it's sick. If it's not of God, then who is it of? No, you know, this isn't let's make a deal. I'm not Monty Hall. You don't have three doors. You got two. Two. Warfare, theft, anger, murder, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they would, they would take this goat, and through some symbol, it depends on the culture, they would figuratively load on the goat's back all these things that they felt were wrong inside their community. And then the goat was driven out, right, into the desert to die. 
Interestingly enough, this is how powerful the human mind is. Interestingly enough, this would have somewhat an effect on the people. After they sent the goat out, they would actually dwell together or live together more harmoniously. You know, the mind is incredibly, incredibly powerful. And, and, and I would think the one who, who invented the mind would know. God says, you know, as a man thinks, so he is. Right? And then as he thinks, he speaks, and it says there's death and life in the power of the tongue. So they would live to, I don't know how long, I don't know if it was an hour or a day. You know when you make these New Year's resolutions, they last a long time, right? <laughs> okay, so it lasted for a while, but they would always, and I mean always, revert back to their old patterns. Not sometimes, always. So why? The question is why? We sent out the goat, we were doing well for a season. What happened? Because no real transformation took place. I mean, I'm just spitballing here. Has anybody ever been on a diet? <laughs> they don't work. Spiritual diets don't work either. You can't sprinkle a little spirituality on your life. It has to be a, a, a massive, there has to be transformation. That's why the Bible says don't be conformed, but be what? Yeah, there has to be a transformation. It starts spiritually. It's not, it's not, you know, body, soul, and spirit. It's spirit, soul, and body. It has to start from the top, and it has to trickle down to the soul, the decision maker, the seat of emotions, and then it walks its way out in the natural, if you will. Look at Hebrews 10.4. Why are we picking Hebrews why are we going to go over a few verses in Hebrews? Hebrews was a letter written to Jewish believers like myself. That's why it's called, and you just thought it was about some Jewish guy making coffee, right? <laughs> and Romans was obviously written to Gentile believers, if you will. And there's a different message. There's a really different message. Basically, Hebrews is saying, look, the sacrificial system is history, but Judaism isn't. That's the message. But it says, it is impossible that the blood of bulls and goats, right? You send, you send the goat out into the wilderness, right, to die. So it's the same thing. It is impossible. No matter how many societies are doing this, God's word says it is impossible Impossible means there's no way it can happen. Can't take away sins, right? Think about it. I mean, the blood of animals, it doesn't have, it simply they don't have the power to take away sins. All that they can do is provide a ceremonial cleansing. There's a lot of ceremonies in religion. I always tell you, religion is, is the way man tries to get close to God. Yeshua is the way God gets close to man. Because most religion, sadly enough, is man-made, and it's external religious ritual. And God is looking for internal relational realities. It's, it's the antithesis. No animal was worthy enough, not even, you know, some of your pets. They're just not worthy enough to pay for a human being's sin before a holy God. Now, I've been to places where I've watched sacrifices. I've, I've seen the, the heads of animals cut off right in front of me. And the blood run down. And they mean well, but their gods aren't holy. Our God is. That just won't cut it. No, no pun intended. <laughs> The sacrifices still leave people feeling guilty. They just do. And in a sinful condition. Somehow, some way, we desperately need a permanent sacrifice 
to deal permanently with sin. Okay? Anybody know where I'm going? Okay. Hebrews 4.14. It speaks of the Messiah's superiority and excellences. Okay? It says, therefore, since we have a great Kohen Gadol, high priest, Aaronic line, not Levites. You know what was cool? Did I tell you? On, the, on Mount Masada, I met a rabbi in an alcove. It burned. He was sitting in an area. It wasn't bigger than, than the Bema right here. And he was sitting there, rabbi, and he was writing out a Torah. And he said to me, you Jewish? I said, yeah. He said, what's your name? I said, Getzel, Ben Meah, Ben Malka. He said, ha, well, he's asked me the tribe. I said, Levi. He goes, you're a Levite? I said, what's the big deal? They cleaned up the blood. <laughs> and over time, you haven't cleaned the house. <laughs> so, so in closing... For you that don't hear, for you that don't hear, I said, and the Levite, all they did clean the blood and burn it, and said, and that's why you clean the house all the time. (laughs) Oh, haven't. That's why I had children, sweetheart. (laughs) The IRS doesn't give you enough of a dependency exemption. We have a great Kohen Gadol, a high priest, who has passed through to the highest heaven, Yeshua. Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we acknowledge is true. Okay. Great Kohen Gadol. There are many, many, many high priests under the Mosaic economy. Many. But none in the scriptures was ever called great. In fact, year in, year out, year in, year out, year in, year out, they would go into the Holy of Holies, sacrifice and sprinkle bread seven times on the mercy seat, right? You notice there was no chair inside the Holy of Holies? Because the, bull, the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin. So you couldn't sit down. But my Bible says Yeshua sat down at the right hand because it was finished. You follow? Okay. We needed one who could truly serve all of humanity. And although the, the Kohanes were wonderful, and I'm sure good people, their sacrifice just didn't cut it. Why did they do it for so many years? God was getting our people, my people, ready for the ultimate sacrifice. He was preparing them. He was showing them types and shadows so they would recognize. It says, pass through to the highest heavens. Yeshua passed through the atmospheric heaven, the sky, the stellar heavens, onto the third heaven. There's three heavens. The Bible speaks about it, right? The dwelling place of God. God dwells in the third heavens. This speaks, of course, of his ascension and glorification. In, in Colossians, it says something really neat. He made a public spectacle. Yeah. Do you know what that means? Yeah. What does it mean? Yeah. To who? Yeah. Who did he shame? Yeah. Where does the enemy live? Yeah. Second heavens. He got kicked out of the third heavens. He got demoted to the second heavens. So as Yeshua was ascending, what do you think the enemy and all his demonic forces were thinking? He won, right? But I could just see him pulling a spiritual Schwarzenegger, and as he's passing through going, I'll be back. (laughs) Right? Doesn't it say he'll be back to chain him up for a thousand years and then finally throw him in the lake of fire? He made a public spectacle. Yes? Yes. Isn't this exciting? Aren't you having fun? And then it says Yeshua. Make no mistake. That's his God-given Hebrew name given to him on his bris. Right. You can't disconnect the fact that he was Jewish. Pincus Lapid, one of the most orthodox rabbis in in Europe, said, "As as I read the story in Matthew, he appears to be one of the most Torah observant Jews that ever lived. I'm just going to tell you the way it is, guys. I'm not looking to make friends, but I'm not looking to make enemies. The church hijacked him. They took him. They cut off his beard. And they changed them. They changed them. And that's why my people don't recognize them. The same way Joseph's brothers didn't recognize him in Egypt. But guess what? 
We're in a day where we are restoring the Jewishness of the gospel. And my people will, they will. It's promised, it's prophesied, and I believe it's going to come to pass. And I believe it just might be in my day. Hallelujah. Yeshua, though, he is human. It was his name given to him at birth. And that name is totally linked to his humanity. He was 100% human. His mom changed his diapers. He grew in wisdom and stature. When he was hungry, guess what? Totally. But then it says, the son of God. He's also divine. His mom was human. His father, not so human. The only begotten, the father's unique son. Look at the next verse, 415. It says, we do not have a Kohen Gadol. We don't have a high priest unable to empathize. You know what empathy is? Some people have compassion. Empathy is not compassion. Compassion is when you feel bad. Empathy is when you feel the pain. And because you feel the pain, you have to do something to alleviate it. You know how many great, great compassionate people are out there who do nothing? Bernadette tells me all the time, you get too frustrated with people. They haven't seen what you've seen. I tell her, what, are they living under a rock? Or when they see the starving children, they change the channel. Come on. There's people in Macon, they can't put three meals on the table. We do not have a Kohen Gadol unable to empathize with our weaknesses. Make no mistake, we are all weak. We are all frail and we are all fragile. Since in every respect, in every respect, he was tempted just as we are. It's just a little difference, though. (laughs) Yeah. He just didn't take the bait. He never took the bait. Tempted in every way, but did not sin. Now, there are some people that argue that his temptation was not meaningful if he could not sin. The temptation was fallacious. I've heard it over and over again especially by antagonists of our faith. But the purpose of the temptation was to demonstrate conclusively that he could not sin. In other words, if you put gold to the test, the test is not less valid because the gold is pure. Let me say that again. So some of you look like a deer in the headlights. Right? Okay, I'm just going to amen him and shake my hand. I don't know what the heck he's talking about. If you take pure gold and put it to a test, it's to test its purity. That doesn't mean that the test is less valid just because the gold is pure. He was tested. He was just pure. If there was any impurity, the test would show it up, right? Some of you go for medical tests and like, it's negative. That doesn't mean the test was bad. It's just as wrong to argue that if he could not sin, then he was not perfectly human. Sin is not an essential element in humanity. Rather, it's a foreign invader. Stop preaching that we're just a bunch of sinners. You're starting in a losing battle. It would be like telling your kid, you can't accomplish anything. You're just a loser. Face it. Do any of you say that? Our humanity has been marred by sin. His was perfect. 2 Corinthians 5.21, this is what the great Shaul said. Boy, if anybody's been misunderstood, it's this guy. God made this sinless man to be a sin offering on our behalf so that in union with him we might fully share in God's righteousness. This verse gives us the doctrinal foundation. How many people went to Bible college? How many? How many people don't want to admit it? (laughs) Ready? This is for you. It's called substitutionary atonement. In Hebrew, it's a zabach. Somebody's got to pay for it. So you need, some, you need a substitute, right? Somebody pay. It's always been around. Zabach. All the sacrifices. Yeah. How can God receive guilty sinners who come to him in repentance and faith? You, the answer is Yeshua dealt effectively with the whole problem of our sins, and now we can be reconciled to God. If you're willing to believe it. 
This is what the great Shimon Kepha, a.k.a. Peter, said. 1 Peter 2.22. He committed no sin, nor was any deceit found on his lips. The Lord didn't suffer for his own sins because he had none. It was a kangaroo court. They couldn't find anything. They said, well, he's claiming to be Messiah. So Romans, you know, you've got a Caesar. He's claiming to be a Caesar. And, and they killed him for insubordination. His speech was never tainted by deceit. He never lied or even shaded the truth. You know the white lie? Guess what? A white lie is a black lie. You know when you go into court of law and it says tell the truth? There you go. Bingo. Wow. This is crazy. Shimon is saying that there was actually a person who lived on this planet who was absolutely honest. Wow. That's amazing. And then, of course, Yochanan, not the immersive, but Yochanan, his, his favorite guy. This is what he said. 1 John 3, 5. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins and that there is no sin in him? In him is no sin. We have to be careful not to think that for a minute that Messiah Yeshua ever became sinful. Not even at Golgotha did he become sinful. Even at Golgotha, the sins were placed on him, not... They say, oh, the Father couldn't look because... They didn't go in him. Why would they? He was just the substitutionary atonement. He just let it go on his back. You check Isaiah 53, 6. What does it say? God laid the guilt of us all on him. Not in him. Rabbi, is it a difference? Look at that. On, in. One letter. Changes everything. Is it important to be careful with the word of God? You tell me. God says don't add to it. In Deuteronomy, because if you add to it, the plagues of the book will be added to your life and don't take away, because if you take away, your name will be removed from the book. Like, you think it's important? You think God, th- well, let me not ask you if you think, you think God thinks it's important? Okay, all right. So, so Peter tells us he did not sin. Paul tells us he knew no sin. And John said there was no sin in him. Yeshua was never, ever sinful. And to go on and sin and to, is to live in utter disregard for the reason for his incarnation. You hear that? To go on in sin and to live in sin is to live in utter disregard. We might say, no, he paid for it all, so now I can do what it, it's not true. It's a lie from the pit of hell. And I know that that statement might make you uncomfortable, but listen to me. I'm going to tell you something that's absolutely true. The word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword. And where there is no conviction, there will be no change. Now, some people might come here and get convicted and never come again because they feel like, I, I don't like it. Do you think anybody in their right mind would have said in the first century when they brought up Yeshua's name, he's a nice guy? Think about it. Do you think anybody would have said that about him? He's a nice guy. You know how people say that about people? Because they're trying so hard to be nice, they won't take a stand. And they're trying so hard to offend nobody. They just want to be nice in every circle. Maybe they're looking to run for office. I don't know. But that's how you get votes. Yeshua wasn't looking for votes. He was looking to obey his father. He wasn't looking to hurt anybody's feelings. He was just dreadfully honest. You know, people say dreadfully honest, like honesty is bad. You ever hear that? What what else do you hear about honest? They go, he's what? Painfully, brutally. Isn't this sad that the enemy took a word that's so beautiful? Honey, you're my wife, but can you not be honest with me? It's brutal. Guys, do you hear what I'm saying? painfully honest like honesty is painful that's because you can't handle the truth you don't really want it in isaiah's day his people said preach to us illusions what they were saying lie to us and what happened they got exiled to babylon it's history because they didn't want to hear the truth where there is no conviction it is impossible to have any change uh, there's some people here today, you, you came 10 years ago, you wanted to kill me, you wanted to beat me up. You told your wife, I hate this guy. Did you hate me, or did you hate the word of God? Some people couldn't get enough of Yeshua, they gave up everything to follow him. And then there was others that wanted to kill him, but nobody said, he's a nice guy. I worry when people say that. If everybody says that, you've got to be doing something wrong. Because you're trying so hard to be nice, and then you come home, you're like the flight attendant. 
Thank you for flying Lufthansa. Thank you for, are they gone? My face is killing me. Then you go home and you complain to your wife. Oh, my God, that guy and that guy and that guy. Listen to you. And your kids are listening to you. And your kids are listening to you and you're pissing and moaning about everybody. And then they see you come sitting and they hey, brother. And then they're like, wow, it's not my dad at home. We better close this up, right? (laughs) Guys, Yeshua didn't only come to take away the penalty of sin. He came to take away the power of sin and cease to exercise its tyrannical bondage. He came to take away its power and cease its exercise of tyrannical bondage. See, Yeshua just doesn't take away sins. He transforms them. He took in hatred and gave back love. He took in anger and gave back grace. He took in envy and gave back blessing. He took in bitterness and gave back warmth. He took in pettiness and gave back compassion. He took in chaos and gave back peace. He took in sin and gave back forgiveness. While he was dying, this is what he said, Luke 23, 34. Yeshua said, Father, forgive them. They don't really understand what they are doing. Because I know if somebody put my son on an execution stake, I'm going to be irate. And he's like, Dad, it's okay. You follow what's going on here? Don't read it religiously. Don't read it churchy. Father, it's okay, don't get angry. They just, they don't really know what they're doing. In the soul of Yeshua, there was no resentment. There was no anger. There was no lurking desire for punishment upon the men who was maltreating him. Who, who knows the Niagara of divine wrath that was averted by this prayer? This is Yeshua speaking at the very beginning of his suffering. Forgive them. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. We can't forgive somebody taking a parking spot. He's forgiving people totally, totally, horrifically maltreating him. So they're nailing him, and he seeks to feel the injury they did to their own souls more than the wounds they gave him. He's forgetting his own anguish out of a concern for their salvation. That's what's going on. That's amazing. That is absolutely amazing. When he said that, forgive them, it procured forgiveness for all who would be penitent and suspended vengeance even for the impenitent. In the midst of his excruciating suffering, the heart of Yeshua was focused on others rather than himself. This ain't easy. And it ain't natural. It is much more natural to pay back in kind. Hatred for hatred. Anger for anger. Coldness for coldness. Etc., etc. But Yeshua took all that sin in, held it, carried it, transformed it, and eventually gave it back as something else. This is the only way sin can leave a community. This dynamic is not just something we have to admire or should admire in Yeshua, although it is crazy, over the top, off the chain, unprecedented, unheard of love. Maybe, just maybe, the incarnation 
is meant to be ongoing. Maybe. Maybe the incarnation of Yeshua was meant to be ongoing. If so, then our task is to help take away the sins of the world, in a sense, by exchanging love, even for hatred. You know, when, when the Orthodox community doesn't like me without even knowing me, and the Christian community doesn't like me without even knowing me, and things are said, do you know how deplorable and disgusting that is for religious people to take a stand like that? When Yeshua says that they will know you by your love, and the Torah says love God more than yourself and love your neighbor as yourself, think about it. These are religious people. And they've judged me without knowing me. But it's a funny thing when you give a million dollars away to build a crisis center. All of a sudden, they're willing to talk to you. Now, some people love me because they see me as a cash cow. I don't care. I'm doing it for the Lord. There are four Greek words for love. One is eros. It's a word used for sensual or romantic love. Do I have eros for Bernadette? No, you bet. (laughs) And I'm proud of it. In the body of Messiah, we don't talk about eros love, you know? We just wait for the girl to get knocked up, and then we push her outside the camp. The Bible talks about it, but we shouldn't. Let them learn from their peers. Philea or philea, love, phileo, some people pronounce it phileo. That's brotherly love or friendship. Do I have brotherly love for a lot of you that I know well? Of course. Brethren, of course. We have unity in the bond of fellowship because in reality we have the same father. So different moms but the same father, right? So a family, right? Without a doubt. I mean, I get rid of this. These, these friends of mine, you know, I'm telling you, if I called Samuel right now, said, Samuel, I need a heart transplant. They think you might be, re- might be a donor. He would get on a plane immediately. He would look at Monty and say, Monty, bye. Yes? It's crazy. It's crazy. Um, am I going to call him and ask him now? Um, he's watching right now. Brotherly love. That's what Yeshua is asking Peter. Remember when he restored him in John 21? Storge describes the love between family members. It's a different kind of a love. Do I love your children as much as I love my own? No. Neither do you. Do I love them a lot? Yes. Every time you're going through a difficult thing, whether your marriage is suffering, whatever, I cry. This morning I got a text. I cried. What kind of person would you be if you didn't? How could you not? There's times I sit at people's feet and hear their story and they're going through it and I'm crying and I'm wondering why they're not. So, Storge describes love between families. Yes, my kids are special to me. Remember what the great Rabbi Hillel said. If I'm not for myself, who will be? If I'm only for myself, what am I? So you're not going to take care of my family. I got a newsflash for you. Rabbi Greg drops dead, you're not taking the offering for the rest of our lives for Bernadette and family. You're not. You're going to move on because that's human nature. And in three weeks, you're going to be like, what are we going to do about a new rabbi? Rabbi, that's so hard. That's so true. It's just, you've got to face it, man. So I've got to take care of them. But if I only take care of them, what am I? I was just at Herzog Hospital and Alin Hospital and... Zichrot Menachem. 
places kids with cancer where they can't move out of the bed, they can't see, they can't hear, and these parents visit them every day because that's their baby. One lady I met, she's visiting her kid for five years. He's never been out of the hospital. But you know what? You know what these chairs are going to do? Help them get out of bed for the first time. You begged me, don't cry. You said, don't cry when you're there, Greg. Don't cry. So I got a sore on my lip because I bit it so many times. It was Brenda that said, it's a happy time for them. Don't cry because they're going to feel like you're sad. But man, when I left that place, I didn't even go to Yad Vashem. It was the last day I, I let them go. I just went to my room and boohooed. And then there's agape love, the fourth love. This is selfless love. This is sacrificial love. And it's unconditional love. It's, it's God's immeasurable incomparable love for mankind. It's, it's this kind of love, and you know this so well, and I'm sorry that it's become so habitual for some of you, but it never did for me. John 3, 16 says, For God so agapeo the world that he gave. See, his giving was, was birthed from his love, so that everyone who trusts in him may have eternal life instead of being utterly destroyed. You know what the crazy thing is, though? When Yeshua split, this is what he said, John 13. I'm giving you a new command. Now, new, chodesh from the moon, doesn't mean something utterly new that it's never been. Like when we see the new moon, you know when you see a sliver? We're seeing the new moon, right? So we go, oh, look, the new moon. It's not a new moon. It's the same moon renewed. So he's not giving a new command because the Shema says, you're to love God before your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then the via hafta, Leviticus 19.18 says, and you love your neighbor as yourself. So it's not like love was something new. God is love, and God always was, so love always was. He just wants us to move in it, right? So he says, I'm giving you a new command, a renewed mitzvot. I'm renewing it. I'm making it new because, man, it's always been a problem. This isn't something new. It's getting worse. People are more selfish than they have ever been, but it's always been a situation with the human condition. He says that you keep on. You see the present progressive term? Not that you go, I'm going to love today. Tomorrow is another story. No, you keep on. Present progressive. That you keep on loving each other. This is his departing words. Now, this is what makes it new. In the same way I have loved you. So do you realize, you might not realize... But as you don't love people, you're saying that Yeshua doesn't love you. The same way I loved you. To whom much is forgiven. See, some people were raised religiously and they think they've been good pretty much their whole life. I know I haven't been. So I've been forgiven much, therefore I can love much. If I put it on a scale from one to ten, if you've been forgiven a three, you can't love four. In the same way that I have loved you, you will also keep loving. There it is, present progressive again. Everyone will know. They won't know because you go to church or synagogue. You know how many guys I know in Israel hide behind their beards and their black hats? They wouldn't lift a finger to help anybody. You can't hide behind your Bible and and the fish on the car. That's not the telltale sign. Everyone will know that you are my Talmudin by the fact, the fact, not the thought, not the theology. Love is not a theology. It's not a doctrine. When anybody talks about love in the Bible, it's always a word of action. That you have love for each other. Look, let's end... Let's end here. Yeshua gives one sermon, Matthew 5, right? Not a million sermons, one. It's so easy to follow one sermon, one kingdom manifesto, if you will. One. And this is what he says at the end, Matthew 5, 48. You've read this 8 million times, right? Maybe even 9 million. Therefore, based on everything I've said, be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, that's a tough one, right? Has anybody read that one and just kind of glossed over it? Right? And then it's so, it's so overwhelming that we just go, well, we're just human. Are you? So the Holy Spirit doesn't live in you? 
So are you born again or not? This is a tough one, right? Anybody think it's a tough one? Anybody thinks it's easy? Anybody perfectionist? How many people are perfectionists? Are you nuts? I'm a recovering perfectionist. If you come to my house, you'd be like, wow, nothing's out of place. Obsessive, compulsive, perfectionist. But this is why I tell you that you have to read in context because he's not talking about being sinless or flawless. He's talking about maturing, yeah. growing, presently, progressively, yeah. through this process we call in theological circles sanctification. Yeah. Let me read it to you in context, okay? You have heard that our fathers were told, love your neighbors. This is a Jew speaking to Jewish people. He has not spoken to a Gentile. In fact, the first Gentiles that were spoken of, of the faith, was done by Shaul when he went out to the world on his first missionary journey, right? And the first Gentile that came in the faith was Cornelius in Acts 10, right? So up to now, it is an exclusive Jewish thing. In fact, he told his disciples, don't go the way of the Gentiles. Now, this is an opening. This is his opening mission, and he gives a sermon, and he says, you have heard that our fathers, who are the fathers? The rabbis, all the way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Love your neighbor, Leviticus 19.18, right? And hate your enemy. Now, the Bible does not say hate your enemy, and the Torah doesn't say hate your enemy. Some people were teaching that. Listen to how deep this is, and this will package up the whole thing for us nicely today, okay? You ready? But I tell you, I don't know what you've heard, but this is what I'm telling you. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Then, and only then, you'll be children of your Father in heaven. Then you'll resemble your Father in heaven. Then you'll resemble God. For he makes his sun shine on good and bad people alike. Do not evil farmers get rain? And he sends rain to the righteous and the unrighteous alike. I should have just read it. What reward do you get if you love only those who love you? Why, even tax collectors, by the way, Jews hated tax collectors. See, you might read that and go, what's so bad about a tax collector? You're not re- it's, it's a Jewish guy speaking in a Jewish land to Jewish people. Tax collectors were in bed with Rome. Rome was oppressive. They were killing the Jews. And what, what, what the tax collectors did was they paid off, I mean, the Rome did, the Roman Empire, they paid off those Jewish tax collectors to rip off their own people. And they said, listen, man, we want 25%. If you collect 28, 3% yours. And all the Jewish people knew that, that they were in bed with Rome. So they were hated. Listen to what he says. Even tax collectors can do that. Wow. So if you love people that love you, you're just a tax collector. And if you are friendly only to your friends, are you doing anything out of the ordinary? Even the goyim, the Gentiles, do that. Gentiles were not considered highly favored at this point in time. Therefore, you see now the connection? Be perfect. Therefore, perfection is to love those who hate us, to pray for those who persecute us, and to show kindness to both friend and foe. That's perfection. Let me end with this, okay? This is the Greg Hirschberg version. Basically, this is what I'm saying. Grow up. Grow up. Been sitting in church a lot longer than I have. have. You're members of the kingdom and children of the king. Live generously. Live graciously. Live the way God intended us to. Let's stand together. Next week we have our Torah Pasha. It's going to be a good one. They always are. And then we'll, it, uh, when I saw it just yesterday, I think, somebody sent it to me. 
I see how the couple of things we did in Israel are going to really connect beautifully with the Torah Pasha. So it's amazing how God connects the dots for us and how gracious he's been to, yeah. to us in Beth Yeshua yeah. and the opportunities he's given us, especially in the land of Israel. Crazy, man. Absolutely amazing. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his very countenance upon you and give you his pace. In the name of the Prince of all peace, Yeshua. The assembly Shalom. I love you guys. Shabbat Shalom.